bid you good day. Our movement today, prompted by one of your questions, will inspire our subject to unfold. The subject being then on living and dying and living again. For the question as it was appropriately put had to do with the process of death and dying. What the soul knows, what the human knows. So in as many details as possible, let us unfold the subject so that it will satisfy those who seek. First off, you have already heard there is no such thing as death. Of course, the body does not know that, and some parts of the human personality do not know that. Even those that are most aware, most awake, most intelligent believe that the being continues to be. That being said, they cannot tell to what degree. They cannot see beyond the veil in order to unfold what the next moment may be like when the lungs no longer draw breath and the heart no longer beats, the two requirements thought necessary for life to continue. What would it be like if you could continue to think and to be and to dream, to decide to be creative, even without a heart that beats, even without lungs to draw a breath, and yet that is exactly what happens. There cannot be any such thing as death, for as you already know, whether or not you believe in a heaven or any other version of a transcendental world, an eternal, infinite existence, that is, after all, a way of life. And so what part is it, if any, that actually dies or transitions? Well, it is the smallest part, I will tell you. It is the smallest part that simply allows the discarding of the body because the body is no longer necessary. In fact, the being, if you will call it the soul, now knows with certainty that it will continue to be, regardless of that next breath that becomes more difficult or impossible to breathe. All things are in some version of aliveness. And so death, if we were to call it that, is a version of being alive elsewhere. Elsewhere so that the part that is left in this dimension or this area is not present enough to animate a body, or the body, a vehicle, is no longer present enough to offer itself to the being or to the soul. There has been a circuit break. One cannot give to the other what is most needed. And so a decision, sometimes a spontaneous one, is made to relocate the being elsewhere. Sometimes this is planned even from the beginning, even from many lifetimes ago, it could be said what this lifetime, for instance, that you now occupy might be life. This is not in essence destiny or predestination, it is more of a creative idea. For instance, a young one may say, and when I am an adult, I wish to be a doctor or a surgeon. He may or may not follow through upon that decision, but early on it seems like a good idea. Likewise, the soul has many different ideas of many different ways to express itself. And in these ideas, it believes that in one life it will do or be this, and in another life it may do or be that, it has a plan. Another example of this would be one that finishes their secondary school and decides to attend university. They are not certain how it will all turn out, but they have an idea of what they will study first and how it will turn out, basically. Of course, then, life decides. 
then creativity falls into place. Then the elements conspire and the soul places before one opportunities and ideas from which to choose. And of course then choice sometimes changes the plan of long ago. That is called free will or better put, it is called motivational will. Because in this case, the soul then offers itself in such ways as move the being. They motivate the being to make a choice or a different choice. This path or the other path, a left turn or a right turn with this individual or the other, this opportunity or the next business in relationships in all areas of life as a matter of fact. So in this process, it is the soul's directive to be creative. It is the soul's directive to be most, most creative. And so it will place into the mix as many different ideas as possible. Ideas are not the same as thoughts. So the soul will supply, will feed the beingness part of you, the part that wishes to be in action, that is what we will call the being. The soul will feed the being many different ideas. These are possibilities. These are like stimulants, if you like. A cup of coffee, for instance. They stimulate the mind to think in a slightly different way. And because of those thoughts, it is able to act in a slightly different way. And so it is the soul's job to continually stimulate the being, the active part of you, in different ways to make suggestions. You can do this. You might want to go there. You haven't explored this yet. And it continually feeds and feeds and feeds the being. The being receives all of these ideas and converts them into thoughts. Now you have an idea that is also a thought. An idea, by the way, does not have polarity. A human idea does. A pure and original idea does not have polarity. In other words, there are not good ideas and bad ideas at the soul level. There are simply suggestions that are creative, inviting. Many of these have direction or directive, and some of these come with a great deal of assistance, particularly if, if there are memories associated with past lives where these ideas are in some way related. The being, when it is in body then, receives these ideas, and because the human being is a being of polarity, then the ideas are received as good or bad or distinct or vague. It is then that the being becomes entirely idealized in terms of moving forward with the idea or paralyzed, the opposite of idealized, in which case the being will say, oh no, I could not possibly do that. Can't you see it is impossible? I do not have the funds. I do not have the assistance. I do not have the wherewithal. Because for the most part, the human aspect is negatively charged. The negative pole in the third dimension is more active. It is more aware than the positive pole. That is why many first think of what they cannot do, of what they cannot accomplish, of what is impossible, either due to the laws of physics or the laws of science, the impossibilities of economies or companions, associates, or like that. This does not matter to the soul, by the way. The soul does not say, oh, well, then, I had better think of some other ideas, or some better ideas, or some easier ideas. No, the soul continues to do exactly what it does. It is a factory of ideas, creative ideas, which are not the same as suggestions. The soul does not say to the being, do this, or go here, or be that. It simply brings forward creative 
ideas from the nothingness into the something. From all of these ideas between the soul and the being, between the being and the doing, if you like, a purpose comes forward. A purpose to act and to accomplish, to do, to decide, to decode. From that comes a life and a life span. The soul is always content. A soul is not an unhappy soul. A soul is not more happy if the being that is active, conscious or unconscious takes the suggestions and acts upon them or not. The soul is engaged in life and in the course and direction of life and that is very satisfying to the soul. So you would not catch a soul saying, Oh, that was not a very good life. It had a very good beginning, but then it got stuck midstream and went nowhere after that. That is not what a soul would say. A being, perhaps, would say that. And we will come to that by and by. So the soul finds itself very happily, very joyfully, bringing forward ideas assisting the being in all of its facets and creating a life and unfolding that life or that idea. The soul will bring forward ways in how to accomplish an idea again and again until the being, the personality self, is no longer interested in that idea for one reason or another. Then the soul will set about following in some way either the path or the purpose of the life or a new unfolding creativity that seems to be born. The soul, by the way, is born and reborn many different times during a human life. Every time the human life becomes interested in something new, the soul is reborn in that area, and very innocently, very childlike, it begins to create in that direction, to build castles in the sky like that. And so the soul is always animated, it is always interested, it is always making the ideas come to life. And in this way, life progresses on the physical plane. Now, what is taking place for the soul while the being that is still attached to the soul is not out of the body. In other words, while you are having a human lifetime, what else is taking place at the soul level? Well, all that you might be curious about related to the life that you are living, for instance, you can explore at the soul level. So imagine that you are curious whether you will become a doctor, a surgeon, or an archaeologist. Well, the soul aspect of you is busy exploring all of these or both of these and every possibility in between. The soul lives, in other words, through its own ideas, those that created the purpose for the life, and it also lives through the secondary ideas, those that involve experience, experience at the level of humanity or the level of discovery. That is what the soul calls it, by the way, at the level of discovery, not necessarily experience because it is already having an experience as well. So at the level of discovery, both the personality, the being, and the soul, all of these different parts of you are alive in the process. Some content to be present just for the moment itself. Some very actively aligning the purpose. In other words, making certain that you stay on the path, either by clearing space ahead of it or by dismantling the past so that one can return a step or two to complete something. Brushing aside those things to the left or to the right that would seem minor, whether it is a minor occurrence or a minor disturbance or anything that would throw you off track. You see, all of these forces, they are literally forces, are at work for you and with you 
all of the time, each and every day, during each activity, during each thought that you consider, all of these forces are alive in you and for you and through you and because of you. And the soul participates wholeheartedly in all of this. Some beings are very connected to their soul, and every night during sleep time they check in with the soul, the same way that one would check in with a parent to say, look, I am home, look, I have completed this task, look, this is how I have accounted for myself today. And of course the soul, as a joyous parent would do, welcomes the being, recharges the being with any life force that may be necessary, makes all moments potent again, brings forward well-being or what can be given or what can be received, and then returns that aspect of the being safely to the body. So for the most part, 99.9% of beings leave their body during the sleep time, at least for a short amount of time. There are those that leave the body most of the sleep time. There are those that leave for as little as 10 minutes, just enough. And of course, a 10-minute timescape on third-dimensional Earth that seems such a short amount of time, is a very long, long amount of time at the soul level and at the higher dimensions. Dimensions is something that we will speak of at another time on another recording, if you like. It is another subject that we may consider from a variety of perspectives so that you will know it as well. But for now, we will stay with the soul and the body, the lifetime, before life and after life, on living and dying and living again, as we have said. So, the soul then is alive in and of itself. The soul is able to animate many different lifetimes if it chooses all at once. So, most of you have a good amount of brothers and sisters that are all part of you, cousins if you like. These in some way are associated to the soul and so in some way they are associated with you, although for the most part you will have no awareness of them whatsoever, although here and there those moments that you would call déjà vu would bring about something that has been stimulated within you, something that in that moment has linked you to the soul, to the forward, to the past, to something that cannot be named but exists as a part of you, something nameless, and it is in fact nameless. How many beings or lives a soul can actively monitor is an individual thing. There are some, for instance, that can actively monitor as many as 40 lifetimes, some even more than that. It is common to have 12, it is common to have 6. For the most part, these would not be in your family. For the most part, they would be elsewhere, because after all, the purpose is for the soul's creativity to learn from and to joy from. So it would be more joy, more creativity, if these beings spoke different languages, for instance, found employment in different ways, considered their emotional self or body in a different way, considered different thoughts. Now the benefit to you, for instance, for all of your cousins in body elsewhere, is that you would have access not to their individual thoughts, but to anything that they had learned, truly accomplished in their life. You would have access to that. They would have access to yours. The soul has access to all of these. So there is never really one purpose that you will lead that is truly satisfying to the soul, for the soul is actively engaged in a good amount of creativity in many different areas. The same is true, by the way, even when you are not in body. When you are not in your physical body, you are not dead and dying. You have transitioned then 
from one aspect of being to another, from one dimension to another, from one understanding to another. In some ways it feels a little bit as if you have moved from one city to another, but very suddenly. Very suddenly you do not know where to find what was always present in the same place. Very suddenly the same thoughts that you are thinking are now located in a different place, as if you must probe a different area of your brain to think. Sometimes suddenly and sometimes not, you cannot quite remember your name. You remember where you have been. You remember certain aspects of the life, but not everything, as if there is already a slight amnesia. For others, the opposite is true. Instantly they remember every detail, every scene of life, every accomplishment, every lack, every success that they have had, every failure, as if they are called to account. And of course, that is not so. But that is in that moment how they are aligned. So here you have different examples of the transition process and we will speak more of it by and by as well. When the soul finds that it has offered to the being and to the life every possible creative idea that could be associated with that life and that all of these have been taken or undertaken or ignored, then there is a time at which there is a tug on a cord, a tug on a life cord, a tug on a cord that somehow slightly reminds the being that they are also more than these accomplishments, that they are also more than the ideas, the activities that they have had, that they are more than the ways that they have shared themselves, the words that they have spoken. And in some way, that awareness now begins to say, you know, I wish to be elsewhere. Elsewhere that does not have a name. Elsewhere that does not have a title, that does not have a job. Perhaps I wish to remove myself from this now body where I feel that it grows tired or I grow tired of it. Either way, some thing happens when the soul tugs ever so lightly on the cord. It is almost a little bit like a rider upon a horse and the two so intimately know one another that even the thought of moving in another direction Already the horse has turned. Already the horse has read the master's wishes and has already made a course correction, and joyfully so, simply to please the connection between the two. It is the same way between the being and its soul, almost always. Perhaps as you think about this now, it would not seem so, for many of the time as you consider yourself now, you have been at odds with your soul, or so it would seem. This hasn't worked out, or the other hasn't quite manifested, and so you think there must be something wrong with you, or something wrong at the soul level. Something is not being communicated, something that has not been thought out. Sometimes you think that your soul hasn't heard your prayer, or that the god or gods or angels that you subscribe to in some way have not heard your prayers. And of course, that is not so. In fact, it is impossible for your prayers not to be heard because of the very material that they are made of. They are made of a substantial lightness of being, but a little bit like you would imagine a spider's web. So the moment that you touch even one corner, all of the rest of it becomes enlivened, electrified, and your slightest desire is made known. Still, it is difficult to see all of these perspectives because in the third dimension it all seems to happen so slowly and it does. Why does it take so long to manifest a desire? Well, perhaps even here is a topic for another day, yes? 
so the third dimension is a bit sluggish. It is a bit slow to hear, to become, to respond. The soul is well aware of this and sometimes communicates to you through the higher aspects. This is sometimes called a soul feeding or a soul's engagement, a spontaneous moment where you somehow have a knowingness of where to be or what to do. Perhaps you might call this an epiphany, but for the most part it comes as a stimulation from the soul. So the soul begins to speak to the being, to communicate with it, not necessarily to call it home, but to give to it such consideration, such observation, as even from the human point of view, there is a knowingness that something is awaiting. Something is around the corner that simply cannot be found upon the earth. Something is taking place in which any activity or any thought somehow related to this life or to this body, it is not enough. There is something else. There is another desire. There is another truth. Something must be answered. Something must be given. And so the part of you that is in transition, that part of you that is alive but always looking forwards and backwards and to the sides in order to decide and understand that part now, even if it was not in communication with the soul prior to that moment, now comes into deeper communication so that the bond between the two becomes strong and strengthened and closer. Now, thoughts associated with this life have more of an answer. For some, this appears to show itself as regrets. Because now there is a deeper communion with the soul, automatically one thinks, oh look, I could have done that, look how simple it would have been. Or, I could have done the other. I could have thought about this, I could have done the other. And now, time seems short. And all of the ideas of what could have been done, should have been done, become more apparent to the being. It is not truly that they could have or should have been done differently. It is now there is that awareness that is simply closer to the soul. And so the soul shows many more and different aspects of itself to many different aspects of its being. And so comes the moment then when the soul begins to gently, mostly gently, most of the time, suggest to the being that there are far more interesting developments, far more creative aspects of life available elsewhere. The soul does not say to the personality, look here, you have lived long or short or lived well or not well and now it is time to surrender that body. No. The soul genuinely, carefully and lovingly puts before the being memories. Memories, visions of a more expanded knowingness those that include desire and fulfillment. Remember that earlier we said that the human part is very polarized and mostly to the negative in the third dimension. And so in these moments, the soul, closer to the being now, is able to restore balance, neutrality, non-polarity, if you like. And it does this by bringing the third quotient or its trinity self together, a trinary thought, a thought that balances the positive and the negative, then and now, birth and death, that which took place before birth and that which could easily then restore itself after. And so this trinary trinity thought then is returned to the being and the being begins to 
assimilate this. The being is you, so that we will be very clear. But it is the part of you that is more than the personality. It is the part of you that is conscious. It is the part of you that knows that it is connected to the soul. It is the part of you that knows that although this life is very interesting and very important, it is somehow one of many or one of a string of possibilities. And so the being in deeper communion with the soul begins to consider all of the different possibilities that are available to it. Not necessarily in that mental pluses and minuses columns way, not like that. In an instinctual way, with intuition, with telepathy, with an open heart, with a mind that can project itself into the next moment or into the next day or several into the future. With all of this careful consideration taking place, the being and the soul together begin to decide what is most appropriate, what is most correct. Correct means creative. It means that which brings light and life to self and to others. And so a general decision is at first made. The general decision being, let us explore further. The general decision puts the card on the table that the being has the choice either to remain upon the earth and actively accelerate its process so that there will be more creativity, or it can begin to consider wrapping up the life in one way or another, whatever way is most appropriate to soul, to form, to the form and to the formless. Sometimes this means bringing on an illness. Now, This is an unfortunate choice, you see, and it is not altogether necessary. But humanity has long forgotten now how to live, and so it has forgotten in some ways how to die. Because it has forgotten how to gently extricate itself from the body, instead it has learned to create an illness for the body. Because of the polarity that we have described, it has learned how to find fault with the body, how to take cells that were healthy and to find those that have a chance of being less healthy than others and projecting those with ideas that involve fears and discomforts and misassociations so that these cells become somewhat confused in the process and in their confusion they attach themselves to other thoughts or other organs where they did not originally belong and during that confusion they remain there long enough to be redirected or long enough to create a disturbance or an illness or a dis-ease. In this way, then, the soul and the being have a choice to restore the body to health and restore such ideas as well, to resuscitate the life, to take it in a different direction, a new lease on life, you would call it in the human level, or to allow the dis-ease to take hold over the body. That is one of the other choices. And of course, a third choice yet is a sudden death, an accidental death, or such else as would bring interest or creativity to the soul. The soul does not see any of these choices as good or bad. It does not have an opinion necessarily of how long a life should last or how well a being has managed it or activated that life or what it has accomplished or how many successes it has had. However, there is a quotient of light that is measurable in each life 
and this the soul can read and to most degree so can the being so can the personality there is a part of you that even now says i am very satisfied with life i am somewhat satisfied with life or like that and if we were to take away the value that says i am satisfied because i have enough funds or not enough funds or like that if it were simply based on a value of life itself there would be a percentage for instance that you would align with that percentage is a quotient and in this case it is a quotient of light well both the soul and you all the parts of you are able to measure that quotient and as that quotient is measured then it something can be added to it or subtracted from it or changed or based upon that light a decision is made so be it once the decision is made then again it depends upon how that decision is made in a sudden death so be it the soul is prepared to receive all that is the being back into its whole back into its own womb and to enliven it and to nurture it and to receive it the way that it does during the course of a disease there is a great amount of time for the soul to visit with the being and to offer many different suggestions and ideas and possibilities there is a great deal of learning that takes place during a disease or a discomfort during a heart attack or a brain hemorrhage or a cancer or what you would term it there are many different learnings exercises that takes place and the soul learns a great deal from these as do you of course the soul does not have fear the soul does not fear life and it does not fear death they are simply different states of being for the most part you do not fear going to sleep in the evening when the body is tired knowing of course that you will awaken the next day and that is how the soul feels about its essence as well it does not fear life and it does not fear death they are all different states and awarenesses of consciousness they are all different forms of creativity expressions of life and light so during the course of time when the soul prepares to receive that aspect of consciousness back into its womb beyond the veils all manner of creativity is taking place in life considerations as to what life is actually like whether or not it has been worth living connections to other beings friends family perhaps there are those things that can be said need be said perhaps not it is up to each being then during these moments many become fully alive and engaged and there they seek every experience that they have not had prior to that moment in life either because it seems that life is short too short or because it seems appropriate if one has said their hellos to also say their goodbyes if one has sought to stir into the minds and hearts of others perhaps at times it is also to see or to look or to forgive or to find or like that none of these are required by the way the soul does not require you or your being to take any such steps not at the beginning or not at the end it is not required for you to go and thank anyone that has contributed to your experience upon the earth it is not required for you to go apologize or seek forgiveness from any other being for any real or imagined wrong however these different creative expressions are ones that can be followed and it is very interesting when one does make the effort with some of these experiences is that then they can be monitored from beyond the veil as well 
For instance, if you were to seek a small moment of forgiveness or balance or what you would term it before the completion of a life, just after that life, you would in some ways be able to monitor how that forgiveness was received or used as a resource by the one that you gave it to. In that moment, you gave something of great value. You gave creativity. You gave life force to another. And that entitles you to follow that light and see where it goes, if it is furthered, if that is where it stays. It is a very interesting process, and so the soul may encourage this for that process alone, for creativity's sake, but not for any reason, because it is something that must be done or will give you any gain in the next life. If you have heard otherwise, perhaps in this case I would beg to differ, for the soul always finds itself creatively in balance. You did not begin a life with a debt. You did not complete a life with a debt. However, all of these type of experiences and ideas make for a very diverse and interesting and creative life. And so these ideas have persisted. Karmic ideas. Now, remember that the soul sees every life and every opportunity as creative and creativity. So, in another life, you may come across those that in some way you have had interactions with that have not been on whole or balanced terms. And so, along with all of the ideas that the soul will feed to you, the idea of how to offer something of value to another may also be a suggestion but it will not necessarily put you at such a crossroads as you will need in that life to pay a debt. More of the time it is a decision that you will choose to make for yourself because when one balances a truth or when one balances a promise or like that There is a certain amount of aliveness that comes from that, a certain amount of life force. It is as if you were plugging in to the sun's light. And when you bring about a true light and balance for yourself, making all things neutral, that polarity that you carry so strongly dissolves, at least in that respect. And so what you receive instead is a great deal of life force and so does the one that you have then decided to share that opportunity with. As life begins to close, sometimes little by little, sometimes quite suddenly, as we have said, the body becomes less interesting to the soul. It continues to animate the body. It continues to offer ideas, suggestions for care and enhancement of the body. But in general, it is more the emotional body, the mental body, and the causal body that become much more interesting to the soul. And the physical density of the body, well, that begins to take second or third or fourth seat to all else. Somehow within you, you also have that understanding. The body is a vehicle. The body is tired. The body is otherwise engaged. You begin to look at life a little bit differently. As you do, there begins to be the gentle close on life itself. And one begins to see life a little bit differently. Some see it as a nuisance that mattered or did not matter or was worthwhile and was not. Others see it as a miracle that they took part in, that they loved and lived and how important it all was. Sometimes they are able to pass this on to communicate to other companions and loved ones. Sometimes they maintain that process for themselves. It is unique to each one. It is unique to the communion 
with the soul and how alive and awake each one is within that process. So as life begins to close then, there is a knowingness that something is no longer needed and that something is the body. And so thoughts regarding what the body truly is and that one is inhabiting a body but is not truly that body begin to arise. Sometimes this is very conscious. Sometimes it is not. When it is not, the same takes place during the dream time or in some way the soul finds a way to communicate with the being relative to the body. And the soul once again tugs a little bit more firmly on that cord of life. And that tug then feels a little bit like a desire. A desire to be more whole. A desire to feel more light. A desire to know a light of a different color, of a different brilliance, of a different essence. One or two more tugs later and the being part of you is just about ready to set the body down. And that is exactly what it feels like. The body begins to feel so very heavy, as if each day you were carrying around a stone, a boulder with you everywhere that you went. Something that was so dense that somehow you must keep dragging it around, unless you decide to put it down. And there is a knowing that once you truly put down that boulder, you will be able to walk away from it freely. For some, this is exactly where fear sets in, because one has become so accustomed to carrying that boulder, that heaviness around with them, that they have truly come to believe that that is what they are made of. How do I put me down and then keep going, comes the thought. I would if I could, but I have no idea how to do that. Yes, it feels very heavy, very dense, but I do not know what else to do but to keep going. So for a time, some do. Longer and longer than is necessary until it begins to seem that they are prolonging the obvious and that the density then becomes so much more. Eventually, they will set it down. In this, each one is unique and different as well. There are some, for instance, at the moment that they have been diagnosed with an illness, well, very fast it goes then. For what is the purpose of keeping a diseased body? What is the purpose of walking around with a body that is going to become more and more dense each and every day? I may as well set it down now as soon as possible. It is obvious that I am going to be somewhere else. Why wait. So that is one example and of course we have said that there are many. Now, eventually comes the process of death itself or the transition period. This is very, very known to almost every individual unless the soul yanks so hard on that cord as if to cause, for instance, an accidental death or as if to cause a moment that somehow becomes shortened in some unexpected way. But for the most part here we are speaking of a well-lived life or one that for some reason or another the soul is willing to take the being back sooner rather than later. When those moments are very, very near the being knows. The density becomes more dense. The thought process of anything to do relative to the body seems very, very difficult or very unnecessary. 
It seems very unnecessary to need to eat. No, I do not wish to feed this body any longer. It feels very unnecessary to want to carry around that boulder's weight and walk with this body everywhere. No, it seems a great deal of effort for very little return. And so the being becomes ready to set the body down once and for all. And there is a feeling of gratitude There is a recognition that the body truly has given itself in service for as long as it possibly could. And now it is time to return the body to those elements that are of the earth and to remove itself. It is rare that a being that sets down a body knows exactly where they are going or exactly what it will be like on the other side. But it is also rare that there is such a fear of death or of nothingness. Most surrender to something that will in some way complement them, complement their life. And so very carefully, very gently, the being begins to move somehow away from the body. It does not even quite understand how it is doing that. It does not understand where it is going, but it knows that it is withdrawing from the body. A life force or that which filled and animated the body begins to lessen. The lungs do not breathe nearly as deep into the body. The heart does not find the need to beat intensively to continue to animate or to pump blood through the body. And so the being begins to move toward one of several different exit points that there are in the body. One of these is somewhere in the spinal column through one or more vertebrae, nearest where the neck connects to the head. Similarly, another at one left or right side of the neck, there is another exit point. In some, there is an exit point through the crown of the head, but this must be developed over time so that it will remain active and open. There are also a variety of ways through several of the vital organs of the body that the soul can move into, out of and through. In rare instances the soul can pass through the soles of the feet and also through the hands for there is a great deal of activity there. And there are a few other minor points. As you can see, your being, what you are, is not trapped in the body at all. Matter of fact, many of you slip into and out of these areas and then they must have a great deal of repair to sew them back up so that you will not tumble your way out of them. So you can see that some of the ones that I have described to you are also ones that sometimes bring about a certain discomfort for you. And sometimes that discomfort comes from an energetic hole that you have created as you have tumbled your way out and then stuffed yourself quickly back in. Once the soul receives your being that has departed from the body. There are moments that are simple. There are quiet. It is not great celebrations on the other side. At the same time, they are not truly solemn moments. They are moments in which the being recognizes that it is no longer attached to the body. There is still an association with the body. There is an association with the life and the life stream. Association with all those who are loved ones or all of the concerns of that life. It does not end abruptly. 
but it is not as connected. One can now see both sides. One can see one's body. It would seem to you that there are some that would make an attempt to scramble back into the body. This is rare. I tell you it is very rare. At times it happens with those that have spilled out of their body by accidental means. At times it happens by those that in some way feel that their life has been cut short. But for the most part, that lightness of being and the ability to see beyond that moment and to be beyond the third dimension's density, it is difficult, I tell you, to talk a being back into a life once they have stumbled in some way out of it for one reason or another. Again, perhaps at another time we will confer in all of the different ways that one can tumble or stumble their way out of a life or out of a body and whether it is possible to reclaim that body or must it begin again. When the being is then out of the body, there is the consideration of the life itself. There are some that have described this as a great review that takes place. Reviewing the lifetime, the many successes and failures and decisions and creativities. This is true, but not particularly in the way that you imagine it. It is more in some ways of receiving a kind of comfort. Something that is conferred upon you. Something that is brought to you that recognizes all of your accomplishments. It is not a judgment. You do not judge yourself and you are not judged. You do not find yourself lacking. For the most part, you are rather intrigued during this time because you are able to see many of the decisions that you made that only seem that they have could have been made in one way or another or times that you believe that you made the only decision that you could have made, the only logical right thing to do. And yet, during these moments, you are able to see a myriad of different things that you could have done and all of the different ways that those experiences might have played out as well. So it is a very interesting time and ones that some will stay with for many months in human time just to see all of the different ideas and scenes and how they would have gone. It is very useful and very entertaining as well. And so the being part of you then still very near to the earth plane, no longer as near to its body, but sometimes very near to its loved ones, continues its journey very gently, looking both forwards and back, constantly, not because it must, not because something is chasing it, and nothing is being offered for the next moment yet. At the same time, it is a very, very active time, a very active time, because one already sees everything that you forgot, for instance, you remember, Everything that you have been, that in any way is relative to this moment, is returned to you. All of the possibilities for the next thought or the next creativity, they too already are present, even though there is no need whatsoever to choose from them. Still, you are present in them and they are present for you. And so life continues to unfold during this process and during this time. So perhaps we will take a pause now and we will offer the next section of this relatively same title for we have only now begun to explore both living and dying from a few different positions. Now we must see what else is present for the soul and the being what takes place in between lives, and what would call one back to the earth for another life. Where does dying become living, and where does each one go?
to be continued, as they say.